Let's learn how to create this 3D and 2D run cycle in Blender. Tip -tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to TipTut and welcome to this Blender tutorial. Today we're going to take a look at recreating this run cycle. It incorporates 2D and 3D elements using both the grease pencil and traditional 3D modeling inside Blender. As you can see, we have this kind of cylinder on which our character is going to be running. Uh, we have a particle system to create the grass and a few rocks and things like that on here. A nice backdrop using just an imported image. And of course our grease pencil object which has our 2D animation run cycle in it. So let's just jump right into it. First things first, let's create a new document. I'm just going to go to File, New and General. We'll select that default cube and delete it by pressing X. And let's start with the most interesting bit, which is of course, setting up our document properly. Over in our render settings here, we're gonna make sure we're in Eevee and we have ambient occlusion and bloom turned on. And under our output properties, we're going to change the resolution of our camera to be a square, because that's what I'd prefer. And our frame rate needs to be on 24 frames per second. Let's make our output properties a PNG and I'll just quickly choose a folder to render these two. In our view layer properties, we'll need to make sure that we have a Z pass turned on. This is for our grease pencil so that works properly. And apart from that, our document is now set up and ready to go. So let's create the actual fun part, which is the run cycle. Now we're going to be using a graphics tablet to draw our character, obviously. And I find the best way to work when thinking in 2D animation is in the 2D animation workspace. So we're going to go up to this plus icon here at the top of the screen and create a new 2D animation workspace. That's going to open up a new window for us in which we are looking through the camera. OK, let's hold Alt and then flick middle mouse to the right so that we can go to front orthographic view. We don't really want to be looking through the camera for this. OK, then we'll press Z and we'll go to solid mode as well, which gives us a nice white background for us to work on. Now, what we need is a grease pencil object to work with. So let's press Shift A and add in new grease pencil blank. Let's go to control tab into draw mode. Now I'm going to go over to my grease pencil layer properties and I'm going to rename this layer to sketch and we're going to turn off use lights for that. Then up here, I'm going to make sure I've chosen my pencil brush and pressing F, I'm just going to give myself a radius of about six pixels or so. You can also press these buttons up here to increase or decrease the radius and turn off pressure sensitivity so that you get a nice solid line to work with. Lovely. Let's get started then. Now I have a tutorial on run cycles in which we're going to complete detail, but it is from the side view. So you can watch that video here if you want a, a full overview. But here we're obviously going to be covering it from the front angle. So it is slightly different. And in this tutorial, I'm just going to create the base form for my character. And then if you want to see how I made the actual character into a witch, you can watch the live stream video, which I've linked up here. We live stream every single Friday. We usually do things like animation or play games like Gartic Foam with my members and things like that. So make sure you check those out if you want that sort of thing. And you can watch the VOD where I turn this character into a witch there. So here we're going to cover the core and then you can add whatever character you want on top, obviously. So there are two ways you can start. You can either start your run cycle with the foot on the floor or you can start your run cycle with the foot in the air. Now, to get things working properly, I like to start with the foot on the floor and then work my way out from there. So um, this is actually going to be our passing position. I.e. you have an extreme, which is the start of your animation in one direction. It moves through the passing position to get to the next extreme, which is the end of your animation in a different direction. If you don't know what any of that means, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just a little bit of animation theory that some people might recognize. So we have our character's head. And we want a similar sized circle for the body. So I'm going to control tab into edit mode. I'm going to select those shapes and then just press shift D to duplicate them and move them down here. We're not going to be using any of these final lines, control tab back into draw mode there. So I don't care if I'm copying and pasting them. It doesn't matter to me. Let's add in a neck for our character as well. Remembering of course that they live in 3d and we'll give them an indication of where their face is going to go. Looking a little bit small on that body. So let's scale that up just a touch and move it down with G and Z. That's looking better. Let's tab back into draw mode. Now, what we want is another circle for the hips. So back in edit mode, we can du duplicate this one again. And let's scale this one up and then just scale it along the X by pressing S and X. Let's have that be behind, maybe a touch large. So let's be somewhere like that. Let's tab back into draw mode now. So this is going to be the base of our character. Now, in the passing position, which is the frame that we are on now, their body is going to actually be straight. So we'll indicate the angle of the chest in the same way that we did the head. 
and will indicate the angle of the hips in the same way as well. Now at this point, their shoulders are obviously going to be fairly flat, so we'll pop in both of those here in a similar size and position to indicate that the shoulders aren't rolling at this point in time. And we'll give some hip bones as well. So this is going to be the core of our character going forwards. At this point, their leg is going to be straight down on the ground, so no foreshortening or anything, which is why it's sometimes good to start with this. Of course, if you had a character sketch or a character reference, which you probably would have, you could be working from that. But instead, I'm just going to go straight through. So one leg that's straight down onto the floor. And of course, we need a foot that's hit the floor and is directly below the um, character's leg. This other leg here is going to need to be obviously sh slightly shorter than the leg that's on the floor because it's being pointed backwards in space. And then at this point, the leg, if we looked at it from the side, would obviously be doing something like this, okay? Where the, the calf is kicked up and the foot is pointed down, whereas this other leg is on the floor like that, right? So what you'd probably see is just something like the foot peeking out from the back of the leg there, okay? And if you wanted to, you could indicate the heel and how that connects to that other leg, just for a little bit of structure. The arms at this point, if you think about when you run, whatever leg you have forward, the opposite arm is going to be forward for balance. And then as it comes down and hits the floor, that hand is going to be slightly lower than the other. So you'd have something like that for the leg that is down. And then this hand here is going to be a little bit higher as it's passing through that position. Now, for this kind of character, very simple. You could probably just do something like this, where you have a bit of foreshortening on the arm as if it's moved, pushing forwards towards the camera. And you could honestly mirror that for the other side, just to keep things simple for now, at least for the bones. Obviously, when it comes to adding the details to the character, you can you can add whatever you'd like. So this is going to be our passing position, PP, so that we know this is our passing position. Now, there are two other important, really important frames when it comes to a run cycle, and that is your extremes. And this is at one point where one leg is the most forward, and then the one where the other leg is the most forward. So I'm going to add in a new keyframe on frame three by pressing I down here and choosing only selected channels. And if you don't see this kind of onion skin here, you need to go up and check your onion skin under your view settings. And if you want to control what your onion skin looks like under your grease pencil properties here, you can do things like change the custom color. Green and purple makes no sense to me. Red makes sense for before. Green makes sense for after. Red is previous, green is next. Now, when you run and you launch yourself forwards, you tend to move upwards as your foot uh, leaves the ground, obviously. But to keep the scale correct, I'm just going to draw over the top of my character and then move their whole form up. So whilst their head and their neck will be in a similar position, their body will have turned to compensate for the uh, hips movements. So if their body has turned, you can indicate that with the guiding lines here, and their hips would turn in the opposite direction as their leg reaches forwards. So let's indicate that with a nice smooth S shape between the hips. That means this hip is gonna be more forwards, and this hip is gonna be backwards. So here, let's foreshorten a little bit the leg and increase the size of the knee. And then let's do the same thing with the ankle. Let's bring it up to about here. We'll have the leg like this. And now we need a massive foot just slapping down, essentially. So we'll draw this kind of trapezoid shape with an indication of the toes and then obviously how that connects to the foot. At this sketch stage, I'm just being really super duper rough, so not worried too much about it, okay? Now, when that leg is fully forwards, this leg is going to be fully backwards. So we'll just bring in something like that for this leg, okay? Obviously that's the knee, and that's the back of the foot there. The body is turned this way, <clears throat> which means that this shoulder is going to be forwards. Because that shoulder's forwards, that hand is punching through the air, okay? That probably means the arm's going to raise a little bit, but also that the hand is going to be much bigger because it's closer to the camera's perspective. Conversely, this shoulder is now fully behind the body. 
and this hand is going to have disappeared off into very small. Again, just doing this nice and quick. This is one of our extreme frames. Okay. However, like I said, the body does tend to move upwards. So let's travel into edit mode with control tab, press A to select everything. In fact, let's um, select everything except this EX here. So I'm just holding control to remove that from the selection. And we'll just move this upwards by about half a head. So I'm taking the middle line of that head up to the chin. Okay, and now that's that extreme risen into the air. Let's tap into draw mode once again. And what I'm actually going to do is just move these frames by selecting them down here in our timeline. Let's zoom in a little. And I'm just going to drag them over two frames. One, two. So now our passing position is on frame three and our extreme is on frame five. Let's press shift D with our frame five selected and move that over to frame one. Now we have two extremes. And to cheat a little bit, let's tap into edit mode on frame one. And then we'll just press R for rotate, Z for the Z axis, and then 180 to flip it completely horizontally. Okay, let's confirm that by selecting and then press G and X to align our bodies so that the heads stay in a straight line and tab back into draw mode. And now we have the core points of our running cycle. Beautiful. Extreme, passing position, extreme. Now, obviously at the moment, we need a duplication of that passing position to create a full loop. So this passing position here, we will shift D that over to frame seven. Do the same thing, tab into edit mode, A to select everything, control and draw a box to deselect this stuff, RZ 180 to flip it, and then G and X to align that head. Like so, that's looking pretty good. Tab back into draw mode. And here we have the core of our run cycle. Extreme, passing position, extreme, passing position. Now, if we were to watch this, boop, boop, it goes very fast, yeah? Boop, boop, but it also doesn't loop, which isn't terribly helpful. So what we're going to do is up in our modifier uh, properties for our grease pencil object, let's add a modifier and add a time offset. Let's change the frame offset to zero and twirl down this custom range. Now this custom range is essentially going to be the frames that we want to loop. And at the moment we have a frame on frame one, three, five, and seven. So if we want frame seven to last the same amount of time as frame or the rest of the frames, we'll obviously be looping at frame nine. So frame one through to nine, like so, we'll then get our frames looping perfectly. Obviously, that seems really fast. And you can see up here in the left that we're getting um, 24, 25 frames per second. So close to what our real frame rate for our document is. If you remember, we set that to be 24 frames per second earlier. So obviously, we need to slow this down. Let's select all of our frames and position the playhead at frame one, then press S to scale and let's duplicate that. So that's currently on frame 17. Let's move that to frame 14. Okay. Let's see what that looks like. But first, let's go to our modifier properties and change the frames looping. So now it goes from one through to five, five through to nine, that should be, and nine through to 13, which means 13 through to 17 is where we'd want the loop to be because that's four frames in between. So loop between frame one and 17 and take a look at that. That looks like more of a manageable speed to me. And you can already kind of see where our run cycle is going from here. That's looking pretty good, but we obviously need some more frames. So I'm just going to add some in-betweens on each of the frames that are exactly halfway between our current keyframes. So that'll be three, seven, and 11. So I'm gonna insert that by only selected channels. That's I, only selected channels, I, only selected channels. And now we have this kind of flashing here, okay? That's looking pretty nice. We're also going to need, obviously, a uh, keyframe on frame 15 as well that's going to act as a tween between this passing position and our first extreme. So for the sake of my onion skin, I'm going to duplicate frame 1 over to frame uh, 17, which is the end of our animation. And then I'll add in another keyframe here on these selected channels. And as you can see, we'll get a easier loop and we can then come through and see our onion skin on these next frames. All I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go through and start drawing in between these frames here. And you wanna keep it fairly linear. And what we mean by that is if we considered this our graph of frames, so we had each frame here. Okay, we had one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, and 17. 
erase that last one. Okay. Um, you'd want the, the movement, the amount of movement between each of these frames to be consistent. If you wanted some easing, obviously, you'd bunch up your frames, the amount of movement between each frame, like so. But we want equidistant movement for a nice smooth run. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some equidistance between these frames here. For example, this amount of head movement, let's just copy the size of the head, like so. And in fact, with the body and stuff like that, um, you could copy and paste like you did before uh, some of your content so that you don't have to worry too much about the size changing and things like that. Or you could just trace like I'm doing and then move your components. For example, I know that um, even though the legs here have reached their furthest point, the arms will continue to move forward for a frame after that before receding. Because if you look at how somebody runs, that's how it works. As they reach the longest point, their arms stretch a little bit further, even though their legs have started coming down. So I'm going to use the red as a guide here to push these arms just a little bit further out. And then to push this arm just a little bit further back. Now with the legs, however, we want it to be fairly linear between these stages, right? So at this point, it's probably worth starting to move our um, object down. So we'll put in a big TW so that we know this is a tween. And obviously at this point, your chest and hips would start to rotate slightly towards the center. So we'll bring those back in a little bit. And this is why it's useful to do it before you move your character into position. Then let's tab into edit mode, select all these elements here, and we'll just move them halfway between like so. Something like that seems pretty good to me. Tab back into draw mode. And now we can see that we can basically go straight between these elements here with our tween. And of course you can flip to see what that's gonna look like. Looking pretty good. And let's connect up Obviously, remembering to draw our bones as well. Let's connect up here like that. Halfway between those two big circles goes another big circle. Remembering, of course, that this does need to move in a natural way. You're not just drawing a direct halfway point if that's not how the leg would move, you know? Like here, for example, <clears throat> as it's coming down to the floor, so as the leg comes down here, you probably see something more like that as opposed to a direct in-between as the foot prepares to hit the floor. Okay, and let's take a look at that. That looks pretty good. Okay, so between this extreme and this passing position, we have this tween. So we can actually just duplicate this tween between the next um, passing position and extreme. So the extreme where the leg is up and the passing position where the leg is down. So that would be the equivalent would be frame nine and frame 13. On frame 11, we can just duplicate frame three. Shift D over to frame 11. And then obviously we're going to need to flip that. So go into edit mode, A to select everything, control to remove these, R, Z, 180 to flip it. And then just G and X to move it roughly into position. Tap back into draw mode. And you can see here, we've now got this passing position as well. So let's look at that. Starting to look a little bit nicer, yeah? So that is frames one, three, five, and nine done. And also frames one, 11, 13, and 17 done. So now we just need one more passing position, uh, sorry, one more tween between our passing positions and extremes on frame uh, seven and frames 15, which are gonna be the same thing again. So let's just do the same thing again, but between these poses, this is going to be a tween. So we're still using the preceding frame here, this red frame towards the green frame. So let's use the red frame again. Let's take the head and the neck. So obviously at this point, the body is going to be moving from a straight ahead towards our green curves here. So we just want a little bit of a curve in the body this way and a little bit of a curve in the body that way. Of course, the hips and the chest are still going to be facing downwards slightly. That angle isn't going to change. So if we check the next frame, uh, this uh, right leg 
her right leg, our left, is going to be forwards, and her um, left arm is going to be forwards. So we'll take that, and we'll just create an in-between here. So something like we want the elbow to rise ever so slightly, and we obviously want the hand to increase as it punches forwards. And we want the same thing for this shoulder here, where this elbow moves up slightly and this hand decreases in size as it moves backwards. Tab into edit mode with control tab, A to select everything, control to remove the tween, and then G and Z to move the body halfway between those poses. Tab back into draw mode. And now from here, we can do the legs. Now, <clears throat> obviously frame five here, we have this leg down. Frame seven, we have this leg in the air. So at this point, it's gonna to have to be halfway through. So let's bring this knee as it's off the floor now, halfway between those points. And we really want this foot to be dragging. So we'll have like a whip as that foot comes up like that. So we'll really stretch out that foot. This leg here, we can do something similar. Of course, remembering to draw in the hip bone on this one like that. Let's draw in the hip bone here too. Okay. So here we want the knee to be growing between those two circles, this green and this red. But what we want is the foot to be whipping. Now, obviously the foot isn't going to be like like this, right? Because that looks wrong, even though that is a direct between. This is what I'm talking about uh, before. The leg is actually got a bone in it, right? You can't change the shape. So the foot is probably actually going to whip through something like that as it rotates around through the body. So let's take a quick look. That looks pretty good. Okay. So let's take that frame we just did, frame seven, and we will duplicate that across to our missing frame, 15. Let's tab into edit mode, select everything, deselect our notes, rotate 180, and reposition quickly there. Lovely job. Tab back into draw mode, and let's take a look at our finished <laughs> roughs. That's looking pretty nice. I think I like the speed of that. So as you can see here, we've got now what is essentially the rough bones of our run cycle. When things move quickly, you really want to animate on ones. Now, what that means is here we have a drawing every two frames, one, three, five, and seven. Now, what that means is uh, going through and adding a sketch to each of these frames. Now, like I mentioned before, um, I've actually done this already on my live stream. So I'm going to just fast forward through this entire section. However, I will just briefly show you how we're going to add line work and color to this. And then obviously you can just replicate this next step for your entire animation. I'm not going to do that all in this video, otherwise it'll be 20 hours long, all right? But for the sake of appearances, uh, let's take one of our frames, say, I don't know, um, let's take our passing position frame here, and we'll just temporarily lock this layer and turn off onion skin for it. And we'll drag the opacity of that layer down so that we've got a sketch underneath. Let's add a new layer on top, and we'll just call this one line work. And once you've done a character like this, you want to start building them into somebody, okay? So I'm going to start building them into my uh, my witch character. So I know that my witch has got, I want her to have big eyes like this and a big grin. I'm pretty sure I, I want to keep like the circularness of her head and things. So I'm going to add ears. And of course, every witch wouldn't be a witch without a big witch hat. Using the bones that you've just made, you should be able to fairly quickly and easily flesh out what your character is going to look like. I don't think I want spikiness on the hem, but I do think I want something a little bit spiky. So maybe she's got spiky sleeves, yeah? And then what would a witch be if she didn't have big clumpy boots? So we'll put in some big clumpy boots. So obviously here is the rough outline of our witch. Now, you do that for each of your frames. And then when it comes to lining and inking, you'd put that on its own layer as well. So we'll put a new layer on top. We'll call this one ink. On your line work, you're never going to 
uh, your like your roughs, you're never going to see it in the end. But on your ink, you are going to see it. And for our ink layer, we're going to leave the lights turned on. So it's going to use lights in our scene later. Let's go up to our ink pen rough brush. That's the one I like to use. You can see here it's got some nice character to the line work. And I'm going to drag that radius down a little bit until we get a nice thin line, let's say 20 pixels. And we're just going to very carefully ink our character. Obviously, you'd be doing this for every single one of your frames. I'm just doing it as one as an example. And once you've done your line work, you'll have something like this. So now we have three layers, sketch, line, and ink. Okay. We'll add a new layer under our ink layer, and we'll call this one fill. And it's on this layer here that we're going to be adding our color. So I'm going to turn off the visibility for our line and our sketch layers now. So we're just left with our ink colors here. And on our fill lines, we're obviously going to leave checked use lights. Let's go to our material brushes here. So we can add a new material by pressing plus and add new. We want to turn off the stroke and give it just a fill and we'll choose a nice green color for the dress, like a turquoisey green blue. With this selected, you can just choose your paint bucket tool and you can start filling in your areas of your character, like so. Now, if your precision isn't particularly accurate, you can try adjusting your position value here, like so. I find around two tends to work quite nicely uh, and that fills in all the little gaps. Or if you haven't exactly closed your lines, like I haven't done here on the hand, for example, you can obviously with a new material, let's do a rough skin color. You can of course go back to your pencil tool and just draw in the shape that you'd like instead. Obviously this takes a little bit longer, more prone to mistakes. So of course you'd have to adjust for that. So you'd go through and you'd color all of your character in this way, creating whatever materials that you needed. Now I'm going to do all of that in fast forward because I've already done it on the live stream and I'll see you on the other side of that once we have completed this character. Like I said, if you want to see the full process, you can watch the VOD of the live stream. Those that don't obviously don't have to sit through several hours of me <laughs> just coloring stuff in. through now and I have colored in all of my character and as you can see I've animated it nicely on ones as well. Uh, what I did is I animated it on ones I felt it was going a bit too quick so I just slowed it down by scaling the frames in the same way we did before so it's still technically on twos uh, it's just got twice as many pictures as we did because I felt like it it needed it. If you feel like it needed it you can add in the same amount of frames as me it's just a case of drawing more frames and as you can see we've now got a fairly smooth looking run animation that I'm I'm pretty happy with. Here, obviously, where we have lights turned on for our layer, you can see that it drastically changes the color that we have chosen. And that's because in our 3D scene, if you go back to layout mode, you can see that in rendered view, we have a light in our scene that if we move around, will be affecting our character. You can see like so. We do want to use lights for this character in our scene, but for the moment, it's pretty distracting. So we're going to work in solid view mode like so. Now, what you need to do is start working on the 3D elements of your scene once you're happy with your run cycle. So let's quickly go through the 3D elements that we need and make this scene look really nice. 
Now I'm going to temporarily just delete this light by selecting it and pressing X to delete. And let's grab our character here, which we will rename up in our collection to Char. And in front of the graphic view again, we'll just move them upwards and out of the way for the moment. We need to add something for her to run along. So let's press Shift A and we'll bring in a new mesh cylinder. And without selecting anything else, we're going to twirl up this menu here. This menu allows you to control your cylinder before you confirm its shape. So we actually want to rotate this on the Y axis so that she's standing on the ground. So let's do 90 degrees. Let's give it a radius of, say, 0.7. It's looking a bit chunky at the moment. And let's do a depth of like four meters so that we know it's wide enough for her to stand on. 32 vertices is fine. So let's collapse that down and left click and that will confirm our cylinder shape. Let's right click that and choose Shade Smooth. And let's press Tab to go into edit mode to reveal our vertexes. I'm going to press Control R and scroll my mouse wheel to cut this into a whole bunch of segments. I'm not really bothered how many specifically, as long as you get rough squares like this. Tab back into object mode, select your witch, snap into orthographic by Alt and middle clicking and then dragging and then press G and Z to move her foot down onto the top of the cylinder, roughly. It doesn't matter too much because we're going to be modifying it in a moment, as you see. Now, we want this cylinder to roll as she's running, and then we're going to place objects on it so that when it spins, it looks like she's running endlessly. Before we do that, let's line up our shot. Let's press O to look through our camera. That's numpad zero. Or you can click this little camera icon up here, this one. And then you need to press N to open up your view panel and choose lock camera to view. And what that does is when you move the camera, it will then move the actual camera with it rather than snapping you out of it. We're just going to scroll and move until we get an angle that we're roughly happy with. And we can zoom and position until we are happy bunnies. Let's do something like that. Now I want to simultaneously look through the camera and be able to see my entire world. So I'm going to move my cursor up to the top right of this viewport here until my cursor becomes a crosshair. And then I'm going to click and drag left to duplicate my uh, viewport like so. With this one selected, I'm going to press N to collapse this down. I'm going to drag it out until I can see this option here to turn off the overlays. Then I'm going to press N to go to view mode and deselect camera to view, which means I can scroll to scale what my camera view is actually like. Then I will scale it all the way down until I get a nice small window and I'll pop that just above my head on the screen there so that we can see what we're working with. Now in this view, I can come out of my camera and I can work and move around and you can see, I can still see what's happening through my camera here. Lovely. Let's take a look at making this cylinder look a bit nicer then. I'm going to tab into edit mode and snap into front orthographic. Then let's turn on X-ray mode by clicking this icon up here and in uh, face selection. So I press three or you can navigate between point vertex and face selection up here. I'm going to grab the, uh, that was a very weird yawn noise you just made there, Toffe. Thank you for distracting me. Then with these faces selected, I'm going to press this button up here for proportional editing, which allows me to scale everything inside this circle, which you can adjust with the scroll reel, proportionally according to the faces that I have selected at the edge of our uh, cylinder here to create a little bit of a hill for our character to run on. Let's do the same over here. You don't want it to be perfectly even. So we'll select some of these faces and we'll just start tweaking as well. So it becomes less uniform. Perfect. Let's go to modifiers and add some lumpiness to this ground. So we'll add a modifier here. It will be a subdivision surface to give us more mesh to work with. And uh, two and two is fine. And I don't care about these lumps here because we're never going to see the edges of them. Let's add a displacement modifier onto that and we'll just call this texture ground. Then under the texture properties here, we can change from image or movie to Voronoi. That's going to give us this crazy lumpy texture. Let's turn off X-ray so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. And let's start playing with these um, properties. Let's twirl down the colors here and change the contrast so you get something that's only a little bit lumpy bumpy. And what we will do is decrease the intensity a touch maybe to 0.7 and up in your modifier properties as well. You want to change the mid level until it intersects once again with your character's foot. And if you want to, you can go into your text properties and change the size value here to basically increase or decrease the detail. Okay, good. We've now got some ground for our character to run on. 
let's add some rocks that are attached to this ground. So I'll rename the cylinder ground and I'm going to shift right click somewhere on the cylinder to move my 3D cursor to that point and then shift A to bring in a cube. Let's scale that cube down with S and press A to apply that scale, control A to apply the scale. Then we're going to do a very similar thing to this rock. We're going to add a subdivision surface modifier and we'll set this to about three. We'll shade it smooth by right clicking choosing shade smooth and we'll add another displace modifier. This displace modifier we will call rock. We will change the material properties once again to Voronoi and this time you want to start playing with the contrast and the size until you get something that's slightly less dramatic. So let's increase the size there, or sorry, decrease the size there, like so. So we get something like that. Let's try adding another subdivision surface to it. And let's go one level down there. And let's take the brightness down a little bit as well. So now we have a rock like this. Let's duplicate this rock with Shift D. Right click to release it. Let's shift right click somewhere else in our cylinder, maybe, I don't know, down here. Then oh, shift S and choose selection to cursor to move our rock over there. If we tab, pressing tab, you can scale it along the X axis, for example, turning off proportional editing and you'll get a different shaped rock. Let's rotate it around, make sure it's still intersecting with the ground. That looks pretty good. And let's do the same thing again. Shift D to duplicate, right click to release. Let's go to the back of our cylinder now, somewhere around here. And then Shift S, selection to cursor. So now we've got a few rocks attached to our ground. That's looking pretty good. Uh, but we need to start parenting these rocks to them. So let's uh, take our ground layer and Shift select all of our cubes so that our ground has the yellow highlight. And then we can just press Control and P to parent them together and choose Object. What this means is now when I move the parent object, all the rocks are going to move with it. Now then, let's add some grass to this. We'll go to our modifier properties. We'll add another modifier after all of these others called a particle system. And under the particle system properties panel, we want to change that to hair and we'll suddenly get a very hairy looking cylinder. OK, before we go too much further, let's go back to our render properties here. And under the hair tab, let's change from strand to strip, which allows us to affect the thickness of the base of our hair. And back in particle properties, let's decrease the hair length until we get something that looks a little bit more like grass as opposed to these wild spikes coming off. Something like 0.2, I think will look good. Lovely. We want to leave our hair dynamics turned off. We are going to have the grass blowing about in the wind, but we're going to do it with a little bit of um, trickery. If we turn on hair dynamics, it will be affected by gravity and things. And as the cylinder spins, the hair will be pulled with the cylinder's motion. And we don't want that. We want to uh, have a bit more control over it. So let's twirl down our render properties here and make sure that we're checked on render as path and render material we can sort that later on. Underneath children, let's turn simple children on, which gives us some clumping, which is very nice. And let's actually up the clumping value so that some of those children stick to each other like so. Let's reduce the render amount to the display amount so that we know that what we see is what we get. Let's increase the number to about 5,000. In fact, let's go even further. Let's go 10,000. So we've got really, really thick grass on our final cylinder here, and that's looking pretty good. However, that's really going to slow down our viewport. So let's go to viewport display and change the amount to 10% so that we see 10% of what we're going to get in the end. OK, and that way you don't have to edit your um, seed number, your children numbers or anything like that. You can just increase this slider here to see more or less of your final result. We don't really want random grass everywhere. We want to control the amount of grass on our cylinder. So we're actually going to weight paint our cylinder so that um, we can choose where the grass goes. So we're going to control tab into weight paint mode. And you'll notice your cylinder being blue. You want to make sure that you uh, are, have a weight of one with your brush so that when you start painting, you can see this uh, sort of color gradient. Red means a full amount of grass and blue means no grass at all. And the colors in degree of heat going through that means a varying degree of grass. What we want is lots of grass on both edges and slightly less grass in the middle where she's running because she's been running on it for all eternity. So obviously there's going to be less grass there. I don't want to draw this with a brush, though, at first. I want it to be a little bit easier. So we're going to go to our gradient tool and we'll turn on X-ray mode so we can see through easily. 
And we can now just click and drag a gradient and you can see that we can just go from red down through to blue. And we can do the same thing here, red down through to blue. So loads of grass on the edges, not so much in the middle. Turning it around just to double check that you've got that on all sides, looks pretty good to me. Then we go to our brush tool and decreasing the size a little bit, we can just start to randomly paint in around the middle here to create a more natural grass division. All right, so now let's control tab back into object mode. And you'll notice that our grass hasn't moved at all. And that's because we haven't applied the vertex group. So if we go down to the vertex group here in our particle properties and under density, we can just choose the group we made and bam, our grass has moved, okay? Now, obviously it's a bit difficult to see at the moment, but if we turn up to 100% in the viewport, you can start to see what will happen. If we tab back into weight mode and we take our weight brush down to say zero or near enough, let's do like 0.1. You can see that painting here a little bit will start to remove the thickness of your grass. So I'm just gonna go through and I was a little bit heavy handed here in the middle. So we'll just tweak and fix that. So let's leave it as that and go back to object mode lawfully. Okay, so final thing before we start animating this then is I wanna add some glowing fireflies to this cylinder. So I'm gonna shift right click to create a uh, anchor point on the top of our cylinder here. Then we'll shift A, a new UV sphere. Let's scale that all the way down until it's a nice tiny globe and then control A to apply the scale. G and Z move that upwards until it's floating above our ground. Now we need to briefly and temporarily tab into our viewport shading view so that we can add a light attached to this firefly here that moves with it. So we'll shift S cursor to selected to move our 3D cursor over that sphere. Then we'll shift A, a new light, a new point light. Okay, and you can see that that light is now going to affect uh, our scene, which is lovely, and all of our grass and stuff like that. Select our firefly, shift or control select our point light, and then control click firefly so that it is yellow and the point is orange, so that the firefly is our parent. And then we press control and P to parent those together to the object. Now, when we move our firefly, the light moves with it. With the firefly selected, you're then going to select the ground so that the ground is the parent, and then control that object. What that means is we now have the ground. Inside the ground we have our firefly and parented to the firefly we have our point light. So if I were to rotate the ground the light moves with it but if I were to independently move the firefly just that light moves with it. Okay lovely. Right let's duplicate this a couple of times around our object. So now we have three fireflies lighting our scene uh, and all parented to our cylinder object. So let's start moving our cylinder object. Now let's decrease the amount of particles that we can see back down to 10% so that we don't lag out too hard. And let's rotate this cylinder. We'll select our ground and in our timeline down here, we need to make sure we're in timeline view. We're just gonna add some rotational keyframes to this cylinder. Now it is important that you check how long your run cycle is in frames, okay? So if we go into draw mode with our object selected and go down to this stopwatch and choose dope sheet and under dope sheet, you then choose grease pencil, you'll see your grease pencil keyframes. And you can see that our animation lasts 31 frames, but we want that final frame to last two frames. So we have a 33 frame animation in our grease pencil object. And you can check that by going to uh, your custom range here and making sure that that's set to 33. With that, you need to make sure that your overall timeline length is a multiplication of whatever your um, run cycle length is so that you get a perfect loop. For example, 330 is 10 times 33, so we could try that. So let's go back to uh, timeline view here and let's try 330, okay? Pressing home will snap your view. So then let's go to frame zero uh, back in object mode, so control tab to object mode, select your ground, go to your object properties and find your rotation. So here we want to apply this rotation because we haven't applied this rotation here. So we'll apply the rotation to zero at all of those values. And now if we rotate along the X, you'll see that it's rotating along the axis that we want. So I'm going to keyframe X. I'm going to keyframe at 330 
I'm going to keyframe negative 360 degrees rotation, which is obviously going to be one full rotation. Let's select both those keyframes, right click them, choose interpolation mode linear so that they move at a constant speed and see whether that matches up with the speed of our runner. Looks pretty good to be fair, perhaps a little bit slow. So what we could do is try moving it twice. So you could go to negative 720 here instead and see what that looks like. That looks much nicer, yeah. Let's do that speed for now. Our fireflies aren't looking particularly animated at the moment because they're just staying absolutely still. So what we wanna do is select our firefly, our first one here, like so. And on frame zero, it will just insert, so that's I to insert a new location keyframe. And that's gonna keyframe all three of our location values. A little bit simpler than clicking each of these three, yeah? Let's move over, say, oh, I don't know, uh, 20 frames. And we'll just move this guy a little bit. Let's just have him move over there a touch. And then I, location to confirm. On frame 40, let's find him again. And let's move him back this way a bit. Maybe in fact, we'll move him a bit further out and we'll keyframe that location. And then on frame 60, we will shift D our original keyframe like so. So now we've got, if you look at it from the front view, you'll be able to see that your firefly wiggles about a bit, okay? If we select all these frames and then scale them down with S, you can see that you can increase that speed and it becomes a bit more obvious that it's wiggling about. That looks pretty good to me. Then let's select all these keyframes, remembering that the first and last one are the same. Let's press Shift E and choose Make Cyclic. And what that'll do is for the entire length of your keyframe, it'll just keep duplicating those. So it's going to boom, 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 and keep wiggling all over the shop as it rotates, okay? So that's now dancing and moving around. Now, the important thing is you need to note that your uh, 330 frame animation, your amount of keyframes here needs to be divisible by that. So we're actually gonna make this 33 frames long instead. So put your playhead at zero with the frame selected, press scale until you get to a 33 frame animation. And now that will loop perfectly in your overall animation. Let's just quickly do the same thing to the other fireflies. Okay, so now we have three wildly dancing fireflies moving around our uh, frames here. So believe it or not, that is pretty much all of the animation done. We just need to have some wind blowing through the grass. Let's press Shift S and do cursor to world origin to move our cursor back to the world origin. <laughs> and then Shift A, let's add in a new force field and this force field is going to be wind. Now, as you can see, that's not going to immediately affect the direction of our grass, okay? So we're actually just gonna rotate this along the x-axis a few degrees so that the wind is being pushed backwards through our grass like so. Onto this, we're going to add a turbulence force field, shift A, force field, turbulence, and animating the position of this is going to affect the rotation of our grass, as you can see. If we tap back into solid view for a moment, you can see here that because our cylinder is rotating, we don't actually need to animate our turbulence at all. Obviously, if we did, we'd get way more crazy movements in our grass. But because of the rotation of the cylinder, we get this nice kind of wobbling waviness in our grass anyway, without any further animation, which is great for us because it's less keyframes. So with that in mind, let's take a little bit look at shading and lighting this scene, and then we're ready to render it. Let's pop into a uh, viewport rendering view, and we're going to add uh, light to our character now. So let's press Shift A, and bring in a new light and let's make that a point light. And we'll just press G and Z to move that up, G and X to move it over and G and Y to bring it just in front of our character here. Let's go to the light properties here and increase the wattage until we get something that looks a little bit glowy. And I'm actually gonna take this color of this light and I'm gonna make it ever so slightly blue because our scene is gonna be set in front of the moon. The lights from the fireflies as well, we're gonna to want to color those. Uh, so I'm gonna color them just a little bit blue as well. And I'm not going to make them all exactly the same because the whole point is that they're natural creatures. So they're not all obviously going to be exactly the same. And we now need to start thinking about materials before we can move much further ahead. So we're going to start with the grass and the rocks and we're going to add a material for the background. But we do need to remember to come back and add a material to our glowing fireflies as well. Otherwise, they're just going to be gray dots in the air. So let's uh, tab into shading view. Now, for this, we're going to be keeping the shading really simple. We're actually just going to use textured images that I've created in Photoshop. You can see here that under textures, I've just created some really simple looping textures here in Photoshop. Now you can do this in Blender, you can do it in Photoshop, you can do it in kind of any 
um, software that you prefer. But I've also included a link to download these if you want to just follow along. Uh, and if you want a tutorial on how to make these kind of textures, let me know and I can make one, but it's beyond the scope of this tutorial. I also have a texture for a rock, which is a very similar thing. Uh, Grey textures with then like a green splat in the middle for a bit of moss. And I have a moon background texture, which as you can see, is just a vectorized picture of the moon with some stars in the background. So let's go to our ground here and we'll choose new texture and we'll call this one ground. We want to get rid of the principled BSDF. And essentially all we want is a texture that retains the colors from our image exactly, but allows the lights in our scene to affect how bright or dark they are. To do that, we need something called a diffuse BSDF. So I'm gonna press shift A here and choose diffuse. And we'll pop that in and we will then bring in our image texture. You can shift A and search for it, but you can also just click and drag your grass JPEG into the scene. We want the color of our diffuse to be the color of our grass JPEG. And then we want the diffuse to connect directly to the surface. <laughs> and that's it. But as you can see, it's scaled up pretty big at the moment and that's no good. So we want to add a mapping and a texture coordinate node to this. Now you can press shift A, type in text to get up your texture coordinate. And then you can press shift A and bring up M to add in a mapping node. And then you can connect your uh, UV to your vector and your vector to your vector here. Uh, but there is a shortcut of just selecting your image and pressing Control T, and that will do it for you if you have Node Wrangler installed. Uh, if you don't, then you can enable that in your preferences by going to Edit, Preferences, go to your add-ons, type in Node, and check Node Wrangler and hit Refresh. And that just allows you to do some cool shortcuts in your node view here. I'm just going to increase the scale of this texture to about, I think, seven works nicely. And we now have our grass texture into a diffuse, which is affected by our material output. So if we go to rendered preview, you can see the lights in our scene are affecting that grass. It looks pretty shit at the moment, though, because if we go to our particle system properties here on our ground plane, and change our uh, viewport display back up to 100. You can see that the grass looks much nicer there. So it's always good to check. Uh, if you go back to your layout view as well, you can go over to here, press Z and choose a rendered view and you can see what your rendered view actually looks like uh, through your camera. So that is the grass done. Let's now do the rocks. We'll do the same thing. We'll select rock, click add new, call it rock. And we don't need to unwrap any of these because they're all base objects that we created with just a cylinder and a, a cube from before. So we don't actually need any unwrapping, which is lovely. Delete the principal BSDF. We need a diffuse, which will connect up to the mid surface here. We need our rock texture, which we can drag in, connect it to the color. And we need a mapping node to control the scale of it. So control T, but I'm pretty sure yeah, that looks quite good actually. Just scale one looks pretty good. All right, great. That's looking quite nice. Let's apply that to our other rocks as well by just selecting our rock and choosing the stone texture and this one as well, the stone texture. Great. Our fireflies then, we need to add a new material here, call it firefly. And we can keep the principal BSDF for this one, that's fine. All we want is a base color that is slightly blue and a mission that is slightly blue and an emission strength that is cranked way up to about 100. And because we have bloom checked in our render settings, we get this nice bloom around our uh, edge lights here, and we can increase the intensity of our actual light attached to it to about 50 watts as well. Let's do something similar to the others. Let's make this one like 60, so it's a bit stronger. Let's select that guy and add a firefly to it. Let's choose this light, make that one, I don't know, 45, so it's a bit weaker and select this and add that Firefly material to it. So now we've got our ground, our rocks, and our lights. The last thing we need to add into our scene is a plane with our sky on it. So we're gonna press Shift A, new plane, and we'll rotate that along the X axis whilst holding control to snap it to 90 degrees. And we'll push that back in Y space until we are sure that none of our Fireflies are gonna randomly intersect with it. Let's scale this guy up until it fills our scene in our camera view over here and bring it up like so. That's looking pretty good. Let's go back into our shading view here. Let's control A and apply all the transforms 
and set the origin back to the geometry just for good practice. Add new and we'll call this one sky. And the same thing as before, we want diffuse and we want to bring in our sky image, connect it up to the color and press control T for the mapping node. That looks okay to me, but let's look through the camera to see where the moon actually sits. Very nice. That's looking pretty good, but it's pretty dark around the moon. So I'm actually gonna add another light into our scene. Let's go back to the layout mode here. This light here, I'm actually just gonna duplicate it backwards along the Y axis until it sits just in front of our moon. I'm gonna to snap to front orthographic view and I'm gonna position it directly behind our character. And I'm gonna increase the wattage a whole bunch until we get a nice glow from the moon there, which is looking pretty good, okay? Now, that looks nice, except I don't like that our character here kind of doesn't look like she's embedded in the scene properly yet. And there's two things we can do to fix that. We give her a shadow and we give her a little rim light. So I'm gonna select my character here. I'm going to go to my modifier properties and underneath that is a uh, visual effect properties. Let's add an effect and let's add a rim light to our character. And that's gonna add this kind of like glow. What we want to do is twirl down our blur, increase the blur to say like 50 pixels on both the X and the Y and increase the number of samples to say eight so that you get a nice smooth looking effect. And you want to change both the rim color to a nice blue, but you'll see that you'll get some hard lines sometimes. And if you change your mask color to the same, you won't get those anymore. Now let's change the offset here to be not very much at all. Let's do negative 50 around 20. Then we can duplicate this room effect and we can change the offset so that it goes in the other direction so that we get glows on both sides. And we've now got this nice little rim light around our character like so. Final thing then, let's add a shadow to our character. So we're gonna select our character here and we'll press Shift D to duplicate them. And let's snap into edge view mode and press R to rotate the character all the way around and then G to move them so that they're just above the floor. Something like that. You can see in our ground down here. So let's do that and then press G and Z until her leg stops intersecting with the ground. Beautiful. Let's get rid of all these effects on the duplication of the character. Let's add in a blur effect uh, with 16 samples and let's blur them a whole bunch. Let's do like a hundred. That looks quite nice. Then let's add a colorize, change the mode to custom and choose color as just black with a factor of one and that creates a perfectly harsh, harsh shadow. And then as obviously it animates, that character is gonna have the same animation, which is looking real nice. So in layout view mode now, we don't need this other window. So we can actually just collapse that by clicking and dragging over the crosshair to snap it back into the original view here. Let's press O to bring that together and look through our scene. That's looking quite nice. We're getting a little bit of blowout on our uh, moon here. It's looking kind of like gray and weirdly glowy. So I'm actually gonna move that back in Y space a little bit so that the um, light doesn't affect the glow quite so much. And we can scale it up so that obviously it's still in our scene. Okay, something like that looks pretty good to me. Final thing, I think I want a little bit of depth of field here. So I'm gonna select my camera and I'm gonna turn on my depth of field under the camera properties. On the depth of field options, we're going to select this eyedropper for focus on object and we're going to click our witch so that the camera focuses on that. And then we can drag our f-stop all the way down until we get something that we're happy with. I think somewhere around 0.5 looks quite nice. That's looking real nice. Um, so the final and obviously last thing to do then is to render this sucker. So to check our render settings, <laughs> God, that's a terrifying looking face there, isn't it? <laughs> um, to check our render settings, let's just go down to our output here, make sure we're on PNG. We need RGB, we don't care about the alpha channel because everything is opaque. And we can change the compression down to zero because we want the highest quality picture. And we will render our PNG into a sequence. Click render render animation and that will render out. It probably won't take too long because it's quite a simple actual style when it comes down to it. So let's render that and we'll come back on the other side. Okay, so that has now finished rendering. And as you can see, we have a folder full of 330 beautiful images for us to work with. You can compile this in a blender, but my preferred workflow is After Effects because that's what I'm used to. So we're gonna switch over there to compile and do a little bit of color correction. 
Lovely, so let's take our folder of images by selecting the folder itself and dragging that over to our project window in After Effects. I'm gonna right click this and choose new comp from selection. Before I do that though, I'm gonna choose interpret footage main and make sure that the frame rate is set to 24 so that it matches the frame rate we created our animation in. Then I'll create a new comp from selection and that gives us our composition. We're gonna add a nice uh, After Effects adjustment layer on top. So we'll press the shortcut Control, Alt and Y to add that adjustment layer. And on top of that, we're going to add a vignette. Let's adjust the amount of the vignette down just a little bit and the angle of view. And then let's choose this pin highlights all the way up to maintain the bright spots as well. Let's also go ahead and add a curves adjustment modifier uh, so that I can do my RGB curves. And let's take the blues up a little bit like so. Let's take the reds down. I like adding a touch of noise as well to my scene around 4% or so. What this does is just adds a little bit of texture to your uh, artwork makes it look a little bit more analog, which I find quite nice. And I think as well, let's just increase the exposure a little bit so that we get a nice bit of blooming on our brighter areas. That looks pretty nice to me. And then just render it as a video like you usually would from After Effects. So we go to composition, add to media encoder queue, and then hit render and we'll see the finished product. All right, and there we have it, our complete 2D plus 3D run cycle done in Blender. As you can see, you can have a lot of fun using the grease pencil stuff combined with the traditional modeling stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, make sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you'd like to see next time. And hopefully we can do more fun stuff like this in the future. Do remember that we live stream every single Friday. So uh, make sure you subscribe and things like that so you don't miss out on those. We do a lot of fun stuff there, including sometimes work on content for the tutorials. So hope you enjoyed this one, everybody. I really did. And I'll see you next time on TipTuck. Absolutely massive thank yous to my level two and above members without whom Tip Tart would have died a long time ago. I love you guys. You're great. If you'd like to become a member, click that join button below. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks and tutorials. Thanks for watching.